when in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, and all the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. When also Zephyrus, with his sweet breath, exhales an air in every grove and heath upon the tender shoots, and the young sun, his half course in the sign of the ram, has run and the small fowl are making melody that sleep away the night with open eye so nature pricks them and their heart engages then people long to go on pilgrimages and palmers long to seek the stranger strands of far-off saints hallowed in sundry lands and specially from every shires end of England down to Canterbury they went to seek the holy blissful martyr quick to give his help to them when they were sick it happened in that season that one day in Southwark at the tabard as I lay ready to go on pilgrimage and start for Canterbury most devout at heart at night there came into that hostelry some nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk happening then to fall in fellowship and they were pilgrims all that towards Canterbury meant to ride the rooms and stables of the inn were wide they made us easy all was of the best and briefly when the Sun had gone to rest I'd spoken to them all upon the trip and was soon one with them in fellowship pledged to rise early and to take the way to Canterbury as you heard me say but nonetheless while I have time and space before my story takes a further pace it seems a reasonable thing to say what their condition was the full array of each of them as it appeared to me according to profession and degree and what apparel they were riding in and at a night I therefore will begin there was a knight a most distinguished man who from the day on which he first began to ride abroad had followed chivalry, truth, honor, generousness, and courtesy. He had done nobly in his sovereign's war, and ridden into battle, no man more, as well in Christian as in heathen places, and ever honored for his noble graces. When we took Alexandria, he was there. He often sat at table in the chair of honor, above all nations when in Prussia in Lithuania he had ridden and Russia no Christian man so often of his rank when in Granada all hathi rust sank under assault he had been there and in North Africa raiding Benimran in Anatolia he had been as well and fought when Ias and Atlia fell for all along the Mediterranean coast he had embarked with many a noble host in fifteen mortal battles he had been and jousted for our faith at Dramasene thrice in the lists and always killed his man this same distinguished knight had led the van once with the Bay of Balot doing work for him against another heathen Turk he was of sovereign value in all eyes and though so much distinguished he was wise and in his bearing modest as a maid he never yet a blurish thing had said in all his life to any come what might he was a true a perfect gentle knight speaking of his equipment he possessed fine horses but he was not gaily dressed he wore a fustian tunic stained and dark with smudges where his armor had left mark just home from service he had joined our ranks to do his pilgrimage and render thanks he had his son with him a fine young squire a lover and cadet a lad of fire with locks as curly as if they had been pressed he was some twenty years of age I guessed in stature he was of a moderate length with wonderful agility and strength he'd seen some service with the cavalry in Flanders and Artois and Picardy and had done valiantly in little space of time 
in hope to win his lady's grace. He was embroidered like a meadow bright, and full of freshest flowers, red and white. Singing he was, or fluting all the day. He was as fresh as is the month of May. Short was his gown, the sleeves were long and wide. He knew the way to sit a horse and ride. He could make songs and poems and recite. Knew how to joust and dance, to draw and write. He loved so hotly that till dawn grew pale. He slept as little as a nightingale. Courteous he was, lowly and serviceable. And carved to serve his father at the table. There was a yeoman. With him at his side. No other servant, so he chose to ride. This yeoman wore a coat and hood of green. And peacock feathered arrows, bright and keen. And neatly sheathed, hung at his belt the while. For he could dress his gear in yeoman style. His arrows never drooped their feathers low. And in his hand he bore a mighty bow. His head was like a nut, his face was brown. He knew the whole of woodcraft up and down. A saucy brace was on his arm to ward. It from the bowstring, and a shield and sword. Hung at one side, and at the other slipped. A jaunty dirk. Spear sharp and well equipped. A medal of Saint Christopher. He wore. Of shining silver on his breast, and bore. A hunting horn, well slung and burnished clean. That dangled from a baldric. Of bright green. He was a proper forester. I guess. There also was a nun, a prioress. Her way of smiling very simple and coy. Her greatest oath was only by Saint Loy. And she was known as Madame Eglantine. And well she sang a service, with a fine. Intoning. Through her nose, as was most seemly. And she spoke daintily in French, extremely. After the school of Stratford at Bow. French in the Paris style she did not know. At meat. Her manners were well taught with all. No morsel from her lips did she let fall. Nor dipped her fingers in the sauce too deep. But she could carry a morsel up and keep. The smallest drop from falling on her breast. For courtliness. She had a special zest. And she would wipe her upper lip so clean. That not a trace of grease was to be seen. Upon the cup when she had drunk, to eat. She reached a hand sedately for the meat. She certainly was very entertaining. Pleasant and friendly in her ways, and straining. To counterfeit a courtly kind of grace. A stately bearing fitting to her place. And to seem dignified in all her dealings. As for her sympathies and tender feelings. She was so charitably solicitous. She used to weep if she but saw a mouse. Caught in a trap if it were dead or bleeding. And she had little dogs she would be feeding. With roasted flesh, or milk, or fine white bread. And bitterly she wept if one were dead. Or someone took a stick and made it smart. She was all sentiment and tender heart. Her veil was gathered in a seemly way. Her nose was elegant, her eyes glass gray. Her mouth was very small, but soft and red. Her forehead, certainly, was fair of spread. Almost a span. Across the brows, I own. She was indeed by no means undergrown. Her cloak, I noticed, had a graceful charm. She wore a coral trinket on her arm. A set of beads, the gaudies. Tricked in green. Whence hung a golden brooch of brightest sheen. On which there first was graven a crown day. And lower, a more vincent omnia. Another nun, the secretary at her cell. Was riding with her, and three priests as well. A monk there was, one of the finest sort. Who rode the country, hunting was his sport. A manly man, to be an abbot. Able. Many a dainty horse he had in stable. His bridle, when he rode, a man might hear. Jingling in a whistling wind as clear. Aye, and as loud as does the chapel bell. Where my lord monk was prior. Of the cell. The rule of good Saint Bennet. Or Saint Moore. 
as old and strict he tended to ignore. He let go by the things of yesterday, and took the modern world's more spacious way. He did not rate that text at a plucked hen, which says that hunters are not holy men, and that a monk uncloistered is a mere fish out of water, flapping on the pier. That is to say a monk out of his cloister. That was a text he held not worth an oyster. And I agreed and said his views were sound. Was he to study till his head went round? Poring over books in cloisters? Must he toil? As Austin bade until the very soil? Was he to leave the world upon the shelf? Let Austin have his labor to himself. This monk was therefore a good man to horse. Greyhounds he had, as swift as birds, to course. Dot. Hunting a hare or riding at a fence. Was all his fun, he spared for no expense. I saw his sleeves were garnished at the hand. With fine grey fur, the finest in the land. And on his hood, to fasten it at his chin. He had a wrought gold, cunningly fashioned pin. Into a lover's knot it seemed to pass. His head was bald and shone like looking glass. So did his face, as if it had been greased. He was a fat and personable priest. His prominent eyeballs never seemed to settle. They glittered like the flames beneath a kettle. Supple his boots, his horse in fine condition. He was a prelate. Fit for exhibition. He was not pale like a tormented soul. He liked a fat swan vest, and roasted whole. His palfrey was as brown as is a berry. There was a friar. A wanton. One and merry. A limiter. A very festive fellow. In all four orders. There was none so mellow. So glib with gallant phrase and well-turned speech. He'd fixed up many a marriage, giving each of his young women what he could afford her. He was a noble pillar to his order. Highly beloved and intimate was he, with county folk within his boundary, and city dames of honor and possessions. For he was qualified to hear confessions, or so he said, with more than priestly scope. He had a special license from the Pope. Sweetly he heard his penitence at shrift, with pleasant absolution. For a gift, he was an easy man in penance giving, where he could hope to make a decent living. It's a sure sign whenever gifts are given, to a poor order that a man's well shriven. And should he give enough he knew in verity, the penitent repented in sincerity. For many a fellow is so hard of heart, he cannot weep, for all his inward smart. Therefore instead of weeping and of prayer, one should give silver for a poor friar's care. He kept his tippet, stuffed with pins for curls, and pocket knives, to give to pretty girls. And certainly his voice was gay and sturdy, for he sang well and played the hurdy-gurdy. Dot. At sing-songs he was champion of the hour. His neck was wider than a lily flower but strong enough to butt a bruiser down. He knew the taverns well in every town, and every innkeeper and barmaid too. Better than lepers, beggars and that crew. For in so eminent a man as he, it was not fitting with the dignity of his position, dealing with a scum. Of wretched lepers, nothing good can come. Of commerce with such slum and gutter dwellers, but only with the rich and vital sellers. But anywhere profit might accrue. Courteous he was and lowly of service too. Natural gifts like his were hard to match. He was the finest beggar of his batch. And, for his begging district, paid a rent. His brethren did no poaching where he went. For though a widow mightn't have a shoe. So pleasant was his holy how to do. He got his farthing. From her just the same. Before he left, and so his income came to more than he laid out and how he romped just like a puppy he was ever prompt to arbitrate disputes on settling days for a small fee in many helpful ways not then appearing as your cloistered scholar 
with threadbare. Habit hardly worth a dollar. But much more like a doctor or a pope. Of double worsted. Was the semi-cope. Upon his shoulders, and the swelling fold. About him, like a bell about its mold. When it is casting, rounded out his dress. He lisped a little out of wantonness. To make his English sweet upon his tongue. When he had played his harp, or having sung. His eyes would twinkle in his head as bright. As any star upon a frosty night. This worthy's name was Hubert, it appeared. There was a merchant with a forking beard. And motley. Dress, high on his horse he sat. Upon his head a Flemish. Beaver hat. And on his feet daintily buckled boots. He told of his opinions and pursuits. In solemn tones, he harped on his increase. Of capital, there should be sea police. He thought, upon the Harridge Holland ranges. He was expert at dabbling in exchanges. This estimable. Merchant so had set. His wits to work, none knew he was in debt. He was so stately in administration. In loans and bargains and negotiation. He was an excellent fellow all the same. To tell the truth I do not know his name. An Oxford cleric. Still a student though. One who had taken logic long ago. Was there, his horse was thinner than a rake. And he was not too fat, I undertake. But had a hollow look, a sober stare. The thread upon his overcoat was bare. He had found no preferment. In the church. And he was too unworldly. To make search. For secular. Employment. By his bed. He preferred having twenty books in red. And black, of Aristotle's. Philosophy. Than costly clothes, fiddle, or soldery. Though a philosopher, as I have told. He had not found the stone for making gold. Whatever money from his friends he took. He spent on learning or another book. And prayed for them most earnestly, returning. Thanks to them thus for paying for his learning. His only care was study, and indeed. He never spoke a word more than was need. Formal at that, respectful in the extreme. Short, to the point, and lofty in his theme. A tone of moral virtue filled his speech. And gladly would he learn, and gladly teach. A sergeant at the law. Who paid his calls. Weary and wise, for clients at St. Paul's. There also was, of noted excellence. Discreet. He was called a man to reverence. Or so he seemed, his sayings were so wise. He often had been justice of a size. By letters patent, and in full commission. His fame and learning and his high position. Had won him many a robe and many a fee. There was no such conveyancer. As he. All was fee simple. To his strong digestion. Not one conveyance could be called in question. Though there was nowhere one so busy as he. He was less busy than he seemed to be. He knew of every judgment, case, and crime. Ever recorded since King William's. Time. He could dictate defenses or draft deeds. No one could pinch a comma from his screeds. And he knew every statute of I wrote. He wore a homely party-colored coat. Girt with a silken belt of pinstripe stuff. Of his appearance I have said enough. There was a Franklin. With him, it appeared. White as a daisy petal was his beard. A sanguine. Man, high-colored and benign. He loved a morning sop of cake and wine. He lived for pleasure and had always done. For he was Epicurus. Very sun.